to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ we welcome you today to our Bible Questions and Answers series. We have some really good questions that we're going to look to the Word of God for an answer to. And I suspect that maybe even you have thought about some of these questions and are wondering, what does the Bible say on this subject? And so we hope you'll stay tuned as we consider these questions together from the Word of God. Our first question that's been submitted today is this. Should we fear the Lord today, or should we just respect Him? What does the Bible say about Christians fearing the Lord? Well, friend, there's no doubt from the Scripture that Christians ought to have a healthy fear for the Lord, not just respect only. Don't get me wrong, we ought to respect God. But what about passages like Matthew chapter 10, verse 28? Fear him who can not only destroy body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hellfire. Uh, God is to be feared by his people because he has that ultimate control and power. Now, does that mean that I'm living in terror or trepidation or that I'm having a panic attack every time I think about God? Well, no. The Bible says in 1 John 4, verses 16 through 18, that love cast out that kind of terror fear. I don't live in terror of God if I'm living right. But friend, I do live with a healthy fear of who God is and that God of heaven is to be feared. Listen to Ecclesiastes 12, verse number 13. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. There's no doubt that for someone who's living as they ought to live, trying to fear God, trying to live according to His will, we can live in harmony with God and not have to live in trepidation of who God is. But friend, let's also be honest about it. For someone who is not living right and for someone who is not a Christian, they very well ought to be afraid of Almighty God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 29, and chapter, or Hebrews 10, 29, and 12, 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because our God is a consuming fire. We want to have a, a healthy fear of God. That is, we know who God is. We know what His laws are. We're trying to live in harmony with those, and we utilize God and His power and His Word in our life. Not living as though we're going to have a panic attack every day. That's not the idea. But with that healthy dose of fear is such a good thing for the child of God to have knowledge of and to live every day in view of that, yes, a Christian should not just respect the Lord, but should also fear Him. Let's then turn to another question that a lot of religious people have today. It's a very good question. And incidentally, if you'd like to submit a question for our consideration, you can email that question to us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com through our email address, or you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions, fill out a form, and those will be sent to us as well. Now, here's the next question. The writer says, sometimes... I see people who sing happy birthday to Jesus and have things like a birthday cake and a party for Jesus on December the 25th. Does the Bible say December 25th is the birthday of Jesus and should we be celebrating His birthday? Now friend, before we go any further, let's say this. Thank God that Jesus was born into this world. Thank God that He lived a perfect life, that he, His life was in harmony with the will of God, that as He died as an ultimate sacrifice, and that He is currently reigning at the right hand of God. Every person is thankful who believes in Christ for that. But now consider the question. Is December the 25th 
given in the Bible as the birthday of Jesus? Well, friend, the answer is no. The Bible doesn't tell us when Jesus was born. I don't know if it was June 12th, October the 3rd, or December 25th, or February the 8th. We just don't know. It could be, we're just not told the exact day Jesus was born. And so, if we're not told when Jesus is born, how did December 25th come about? Well, men throughout time have attached that day to the birth of Jesus, although there are several things in the Scripture which lead us to believe it was probably not that time of year in that part of the world. Uh, there are too many things that seem to indicate it was not that time, but we don't know. And so, should we celebrate December 25th as the birth of Jesus? Well, if we don't know that's the day, how could we? If you were born on March the 12th and I celebrated your birthday on September the 13th, how would you feel? Well, you probably wouldn't like it. It's not your birthday. I don't, I don't know when Jesus is born. Now, let's ask a maybe even more relevant question. Does the Bible teach we should celebrate the birth of Jesus? Friend, we find nowhere in Scripture where Christians are commanded to celebrate the birth of Christ. We, we just don't, we're not told to do that. People were excited when He came into the world. They glorified God. It was a wonderful event. But as far as Christians and the New Testament church goes, we don't find authority for doing that. Someone says, well, it won't matter. Well, friend, we're not to go beyond what's written, right? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. We're not to add to or take away. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. If we're to follow the Bible as our guide, and we are, then the Bible doesn't tell us to do that. Well, someone says, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. That's not the way we operate. The Bible also says don't inject heroin into your veins. Are you going to go do it because of that? We operate based off what the Bible does tell us to do, what the Bible warns us against, and things that are mentioned specifically in Scripture. Now, is there something that Christians are told to remember about Christ? Absolutely. It's not His birth. Please don't misunderstand me. Thank God Jesus is born into the world. Thank God for His stellar life, His sacrifice, and things like unto that. But it's not His birth. It's His death that Christians are commanded to remember and to honor Him through. And we do that when we partake the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28, as He took that bread and as He took that fruit of the vine, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of Me. We honor Christ as we partake the Lord's Supper. We honor His life and His death every first day of the week. Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. And so I know there are a lot of people who, who you know, want to have this idea of having a birthday party for Jesus and having a cake and celebrating His birthday on December 25th. We don't know when it is. The Bible doesn't tell us when His birthday is, and the Bible tells us we honor Christ by remembering His death through the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And so, is it wrong for a person to be thankful for that Jesus was born? No. Could you be thankful for that any day? Absolutely. But now, friend, as far as celebrating His birthday and, you know, and having a cake and doing all that, we just don't find any of that. That's American, more American culture than anything, and we don't find, thing, find things like that anywhere in the Scripture. All right, let's then turn our attention to another question that has been submitted by a viewer of our program. This person asks, What is the rock that the church is built on that is mentioned in Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19. Is that rock Peter? And so let's turn our attention to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. And I want you to look at what He asked His disciples, the context of what He asked His disciples, beginning in verse number 13. The Bible says when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not 
prevail against it. And so we consider the question from the context of these verses, what is the rock that Jesus built the church on? Or what is the rock the church is built upon? Is it Peter? Well, consider if it is Peter, that it is not a very firm, stable foundation to build the church on. Consider that with me for just a moment. In Luke chapter 23, in John chapter 18, and in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27 as well, Jesus promised to Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter wept bitterly when he heard that rooster crow. Uh, you also were one of them. No, no, not me. Y your speech betrays you. I wasn't one. And the text tells us he began to curse and swear. I don't even know the man. Are we saying that's the rock the church was built on? Not a very firm foundation. You turn then to Galatians chapter 2 and we consider Peter's character after that point in time. When certain Jews came around, uh, Peter didn't want to have anything to do with Gentiles, but when they weren't around, he would associate with the Gentiles. And the Bible says the Apostle Paul rebuked him to his face because he was to be blamed. Peter played the hypocrite. With the Jews there, he played one person. Gentiles there, he was another person. Is that the rock the church was built on? Again, not a very firm foundation. But what according to the context do we know? Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He said, I say to you that you're Peter, Petra. That word means a small stone or a pebble. He said, I say to you that you're a small stone or a pebble, but upon this Petras, this boulder, this foundation rock, I will build my church. Peter's a small stone or a pebble. What's this foundation? Well, back up a little in context. Who do men say that I am? Some Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Who do you say I am? Peter spoke up. And he said, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, and I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock, on the fact that you have recognized, I am the Messiah, the Son of God, I'll build my church. Church is not built on Peter. It's built on that foundational statement. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Now friend, that's a stable foundation. Je Jesus cannot lie. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He has not committed any type of sin, nor was guile or deceit found in His mouth. Hebrews 4, 15. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22. And He's that foundation. Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians 3, 11. No other foundation can any man lay, listen now, except that which is laid. What is it, Paul? Jesus Christ. Paul confirmed what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 13 through 18. He's the foundation. Christ is that, that foundational interlocking stone, according to Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. And so Peter's not what the church is built on. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is built on the fact He's the Messiah. He's the Son of Almighty God. Now we turn our attention to another question for our consideration today that has been submitted. And again, if you'd like to turn in a question or if you'd like to submit a question for answering as well, you can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com. We'd be happy to try to give a Bible answer to those questions. Now here's the question that's been asked. I know some congregations that do not have or are not trying to have elders today. Should the Lord's church have elders today? Well, friend, the Bible definitively says the Lord's church, the Lord's church should have elders today. And if they don't, it ought to be something they're working toward. And if they're not working toward that, something is definitely awry in that congregation. Let me illustrate. Titus chapter 1 verse 5 will be the first verse that we would direct your attention to. Paul sent Titus to the island of Crete to work with the Lord's church and he was given a specific purpose for going there and notice what is said in Titus 1 verse number 5. Paul said to Titus, For this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking, watch this now, and appoint elders, plurality, in every city as I commanded you. Congregation would be in the city and so you've got elders in every congregation is the idea. And so is it the case that every congregation ought to have elders? You bet. Appoint elders in every city. That's the idea 
congregation ought to have elders. Uh, listen to what Paul said in Acts chapter 14, verse number 17. Here we learn more about the appointing of elders in the congregations that Paul had worked with on his missionary journeys. The Bible says in Acts chapter 14, as they're going around, as they're strengthening the churches, Acts 14, verse 23, so when they had appointed elders, listen now, in every church, Prayed with fasting, they commend them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is the reason I left you in Crete, point elders in every city. They appointed elders in every church. Kind of the same idea there. And so is it the case that every congregation of the Lord's people, the ideal pattern is for every congregation to have qualified elders? There's no doubt about that as you read the Scripture. Now, let's say a congregation doesn't have those. Maybe it's a young congregation. Maybe it's a congregation that was set up in an area where Christians have been converted and they're novices, but some of them are growing well, and they're working toward that goal. That's good. If they're working toward that goal, if that's what they're trying to obtain and attain to, then, friend, that's, that's following the pattern. But then let's look at a different side of that coin. Let's say that a congregation has been in existence for 30, 40, 50, maybe even 100 years, and it's never had elders. We've got a big problem. It needs to be striving to appoint elders. God's church is set up in every congregation to be led by elders. If people are working toward that goal, then that's good. But if we're not working toward it, I will guarantee you something is lacking. Something's not in order like God wants it to, and eventually problems are going to arise because there are no elders in that congregation to help with spiritual matters. And so it is something that God wants in every church, and if it's not being worked toward, if that goal is not the divine goal people are working toward, then we need to rethink things in that congregational area. And so that would be the answer we would give from Scripture related to that idea. All right, another question has been submitted, and this is such a good one that I know a lot of people have a question about. Listen to the question that this writer asked. The individual says, It seems like every time I go to church, they're asking me for money. I get so tired of this. What does the Bible say about the church asking for money? You know, I've heard people say things like on this for The church is, you know, just haggling me all the time. Uh, you need to give this amount of money. You need to give more money. You need to, you need to sign out an intent letter saying you're going to give this much every year. And the church, re wait a minute now. What really we're considering today is, what's the Christian, the individual Christian, and his responsibility to give? My giving and the Christian's giving is a matter between him and God. Should the church preach what the Bible says about giving? No doubt it should. Should elders in a congregation encourage people to give as God teaches in the Bible? Absolutely. But friend, that's a matter between the individual and God. Are there guidelines for that? Sure there are. And let's share some of those today. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 does set a standard that it is every Christian's responsibility to give to the work of God on the first day of the week. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And so the Apostle Paul said, as we've prospered, as God has blessed us, blessed us beyond measure, beyond what we need, on the first day of the week, Christians should give to the local work of the church. There's no denying that's in the Bible. Now, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and notice what the Scripture says beginning in verse 6. God says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm to give as I prospered and as I purpose in my heart. And friend, that purpose and that prospering, I know and God knows. God knows if I'm giving as I prosper. God knows if I purposed in my heart. And friend, here's what's, here's what's unique 
about the church of Christ. Nobody's ever going to come up and beg you for your money. Nobody's ever going to come up and ask you how much you give. Nobody's ever going to come ask you to sign a letter of intent for the year for giving. Giving is an individual matter between the individual and God. We preach on it. We encourage people to give as the Bible says. There are various works and opportunities that are made available if people so wish to give to. But we realize that's the individual's choice. That's the individual's matter. Now friend, here's something I ask you to consider. If a place is all about you know, how much you can give and how much money you've got and, and if that place is always begging you for money, I'd have to wonder about the intent of that. Are they concerned about souls? Are they concerned about the lost? Are they concerned about following the pattern of giving that we've just read in the New Testament? Or are they more concerned about what's in your wallet than what's in your heart? And friend, we want to help people to align their wallet with their heart through the teaching of the Bible, but nobody's ever going to beg you or you know, ask you, how much are you giving or you need to give more. You're not giving it. No, that's an individual matter between the Christian and God. And so somewhere that is always haggling or trying to get people, to, that's not what we find through the language of the New Testament. And we want to be very careful about things like under that. All right, here's another question for our consideration today. I recently heard someone say that the Apostle Peter was also the first pope. Is this true? And what evidence is there of this in Scripture? Well, friend, no, it is not true. And no, we do not find in the Bible that Peter was the first pope or a pope at all. What do we find about Peter? We find that Peter was an elder among a plurality of elders. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, Peter served as an elder, as we've seen in Acts 14, 17, and Titus 1, verse 5, there was always a plurality of those in the congregation of God's people. But what about Peter being the first pope? Well, friend, if Peter's the first pope, he did it a whole lot different than it's being done today. What do I mean by that? Look in Acts chapter 10, if you would. Peter didn't want people worshiping him. He didn't want people bowing down to him. He didn't want people kissing his ring or his finger or anything like that. Notice what you find in Acts chapter 10, verse number 25. As Peter was coming in, the Bible says, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. Again, we don't find anywhere Peter was the Pope. That's contrary to what you find in the Bible. We know he was an elder among a plurality of elders in the Lord's church. 1 Peter 5, Acts 14, verse 23. But friend, think about Peter here. Now you contrast this with what you see today, okay? Here's another unique identifying mark. Cornelius was so impressed when Peter, a Jew, came to preach him the gospel that he fell down and attempted to worship him. What did Peter do? Did he say, you like my ring and my funny hat, want to kiss it? No, Peter said, stand up. I myself am also a man. Now, contrast that with today, where millions of people, and you see it on TV, go to Rome, and they kiss the Pope's hand, they bow down before him, and he just accepts all that. Wait a minute. Peter said, don't do it. The Pope accepts that today. Who's right? Let God be true, and every man a liar. Nowhere in the Bible is Peter mentioned as the first pope. You don't find that. Peter was married, according to 1 Peter 5 and 1 Timothy 3, 1. That's a qualification of an elder. He was an elder. He was married. He was an apostle of the Lord. He was a great servant of God. But we never find anywhere. You've got to go beyond the Bible, which we're told not to do. Do not add to the word. Uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. You've got to go beyond the Bible to come up with those ideas. And so we hope today that these questions have encouraged each of us to get out our Bible, to study for ourselves, to see if what we're being taught and what we believe is true to the Scripture. And if it's not, then friend, the burden is upon us to make changes in our lives where necessary so that we can be in line and in harmony with the will of God. Now we remind you again that if you have a question that you'd like to submit, 
You can email those questions to us. Uh, questions at thegospelofchrist.com is the email address. If you'll email those to us, we'll uh, do our best to try to give a Bible answer to them. Or you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions, and we'd be happy to receive those questions and do our best to try to give a Bible answer. But friend, more than anything today, we want you to know that the God of heaven loves you deeply. He loves you so much. He sent His own Son to die for you, John 3.16. He wants you to live in heaven with Him and to be saved, 1 Timothy 2.4. Would you do what they did on Pentecost to be saved? When they heard the message and believed in Jesus, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2 verse 38. If you've never done that, or if you'd like to study more, please let us know. We'd be glad to help you, and may God bless each of us as we strive to study His Word and live in harmony with His will. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.